that's 10 trillion 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 times. <laughs> and this is important because my colleagues who are not believers will say, well, yes, the space-time theorems prove there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created this universe of matter, energy, space, and time. But like Stephen Hawking, they'll say, this isn't a personal God. This is an impersonal God. But now we're looking at this, quote, impersonal God, fine-tuning design to 10 to the 97 times better than what we humans can achieve, which means that this causal agent beyond space and time, at a minimum, is 10 to the 97 times more intelligent than we are, more knowledgeable than we are, and better funded than we are. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. so. Yeah. If it's power, intellect, knowledge, creativity, that's a person. Yeah. Only a person can manifest those attributes. But it's a personality that's so far beyond what we see, say, in Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam, that it isolates the God of the Bible. We're not only proving the existence of God, we're proving the existence of the God of the Bible. A God who's got 12 different purposes minimum for making the universe the way he did, and many more purposes than that for why he created human beings. Now you've got uh, a number of uh, appendices in the back of the book. And one that I was fascinated with was what uh, it was Appendix D, where you talk about creation accounts in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Normally, when we think about creation accounts, we think about the first few chapters of Genesis. Right. But you've got uh, Genesis, uh, Job, Psalms, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Romans, Corinthians, Hebrews, Peter, Revelation. Uh, quite a quite a um, a lot of substance there. From your perspective as an astronomer. Um, how trustworthy is the Bible in terms of what it says about uh, creation? Well, I'm, I'm not just an astronomer, I'm also a pastor. And the thing I've noticed is that Christians have a tendency to isolate certain texts. Yeah. You need to look at all 66 books of the Bible. And that's why I put that appendix in there, just to show people how much creation content e exists in the Bible. And it's not enough to take the Bible literally. We have to take it literally and consistently. And we do that, we see a perfect fit with God's second book, the book of nature. Belgic Confession, 1561. God gave us two books, the book of scripture, the book of nature. God faithfully and in a trustworthy manner reveals himself through both. And that's kind of the mission of reasons to believe, is to show people how we can constructively integrate these two books in a way that removes people's doubts and gives them new reasons to believe in Christ as creator, Lord, and Savior. Uh, what do you say to those who say that science and uh, Christianity are uh, antithetical, that they're at odds with one another? Well, there's a basis for that. Uh, science is not the same as the book of nature. It's our interpretation of the right, book of right. nature. Theology is not the same as the words of the Bible. It's our interpretation mm -hmm. of the words of the Bible. How do you f ferret out the faulty interpretations? Through constructive integration. Look at all 66 books. Make sure your creation theology is consistent with Job and Proverbs and Psalms and Isaiah, as well as Genesis. And there you'll be uh, on a sure pathway to truth. In his book, Cosmos, which I read years ago, to me it was a page turner by Carl Sagan. Mm -hmm. He starts off by saying, the universe is all there is, was, and ever will be. It seemed to me that was a theological statement. It seemed Definitely. to me that what he was saying was, I am a pantheist. Uh, am I correct? You're right, yeah. Now, you were, you were his student. Um, did, did his uh, view of the universe change as more knowledge became available? I, I know he's, he, has got, he has died, but... Um, well, as far as we know, he never departed from that statement, the universe is all there is or was or ever will be, and Hawking in the grand design is making the same presumption. Yeah. Uh, that that's the totality. Like that's a theological statement. It definitely is. And that's, that's why, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is that God is not limited to just one creation. The universe is the best possible creation for bringing about the end of all evil and suffering. But it's not God's ultimate goal. He made a separate realm for the angels. We're told that the angels are intently watching us to learn about the grace of God but God has promised a new creation that will replace this universe. So our ultimate destiny is not in this universe. Well, Paul says that all creation is uh, trembling in anticipation of, right, the, right. of the moment when uh, all of the sons of men will have been fulfilled and uh, uh, we can get on with the new creation. Exactly. Now, what, what, do, you think, what do you think about Hawking's um, 
I don't know if it's a supposition or a presumption or, or what it is, but he talks about uh, 11 dimensions. Yes. Well, what do, you, what, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, this is something that physicists and astronomers now accept, is that uh, in addition to length, width, height, and time, there are six very tiny dimensions of space that accompany the three big ones. Right. It's crucial in order to be able to successfully integrate the physics of quantum mechanics with the physics of gravity. So I don't know any physicist that doubts that. Uh, the speculation is uh, one raised by Hawking and Lydno, where they say maybe there's a, a dimension beyond that. So that's where they come up with the 11th dimension. And this is the M-theory idea, that there's all these uh, uh, ten-dimensional universes embedded in an eleventh dimension. But at this point is pure speculation. In fact, uh, Albert Einstein's uh, general relativity proves it will always be pure speculation. Because if God were to make one universe here with ten space-time dimensions, once you've got observers in that universe, it can never overlap another possibly existing universe over here. So we'll never learn anything about that universe. Yeah. It's impossible, but the Bible tells us God did make more than one realm. Yeah, uh, and uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this fascinating concept of t being caught up into the, uh, the third heaven, you know. Sure. Um, just a couple of minutes left, uh, I was very uh, fascinated by your uh, biblical uh, exegesis uh, in the latter part of the book, and this concept of the new heaven, mm -hmm. the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, in, in two minutes, what do you see happening there? God's going to deliver us from the shackles of space, time, and the laws of physics. I mean, God did give us a free will, but the free will is necessarily hampered by the physics as a tool, partly as a tool, for God to bring about the end of all evil. When evil is gone, we no longer need to be constrained to a single dimension of time where time can't be stopped or reversed. And what you notice in Revelation 20, 21 and 22, is that we're going to have the capability of geometric relationships rather than just linear relationships. Mm. I'll never be apart from my wife for the rest of eternity, but then that no way will constrain me from having intimate relationships with as many other people as possible. I won't have to wait in line to have a private appointment with the Apostle Paul. All that's possible because evil no longer exists. God can trust us with something more than just linear time. He can trust us with something more than just length, width, and height, and we no longer have to be constrained by gravity, thermodynamics, uh, or electromagnetism. God's going to give us brand new physics, which is going to make a depth of relationship and intimacy far beyond anything we can think or imagine right now. So I'm looking forward to it. I wanted people to read about this wow, sure. so they can really consider What Paul say, eyes not seen, ears not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, the incredible things that await. But he wants us to think and meditate about it nonetheless. That's right, think and meditate about it. Uh, Dr. Hugh Ross, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. There's the book, friends. It's published by Baker. You want to read this book. Now, we're not making it available to you here. You've got to go and, you know, pay for it. <laughs> go into your bookstore and say, I want Hugh Ross's book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. You will be absolutely fascinated, and it will inspire you. Thanks for coming our way. Welcome.